I remember when I was a kid, reading a book in school, about old urban legends from the northeastern U.S. There was one story about a town in Pennsylvania, whose name I have forgotten, but it was described similar to Salem, or Sleepy Hollow. It was a historic old town, steeped in superstition, located deep in a secluded, wooded area of Pennsylvania. In the story, the town had a strict curfew of 12 a.m., with law enforcement detaining anyone outside after midnight. In addition to the curfew, the town had some strange rules that must be followed. The first rule, everyone must be indoors by 12 a.m., with doors and windows shut and locked, and curtains closed. The second rule, no one should stay awake past 3 a.m. The third, and final rule, if you hear a tapping on your window, do not look through the curtains, do not open the window, and do not let them in. That story stood out to me, as it mentioned dark shadowy humanoid figures, with black eyes, that appeared at 3 a.m., and who could sense when someone was awake, and would be drawn to their homes. They would tap on their victims' windows, and if you looked into their large black eyes, you would be instantly hypnotized, and tricked into letting them in. Once inside, all the occupants would become victims of the black-eyed shadow people, and would vanish without a trace. One summer, I spent a weekend with my sister at my cousin's house. My cousin, who was a single mother, had just moved out of Queens, to a rural area in Pennsylvania, and invited us to visit while she was getting settled. I was probably 10 or 11 years old at the time, and my cousin and sister were both in their early 20s. At the time, what surprised me most about the trip, was how green the landscape was. It was a sea of trees, and not much else. The highways gave way to narrow roads, which weave through endless wilderness, with the occasional isolated farm, seemingly pulled straight out of a horror movie. When we reached my cousin's house, I was surprised to see that it was actually a townhouse, attached to several others forming a large two-story rectangular complex, with numbered parking spaces in front. Each townhouse consisted of a main entrance, directly in front of the assigned parking space. Directly behind the entrance, was a staircase leading to the two second-floor bedrooms, and bathroom, while to the right of the entrance was a small living space, with kitchen and half-bath, in an open-floor layout. There were windows on the front, and back with a rear door, leading to a tiny deck and shared yard. It was the beginning of, what would later be expanded into a much larger private housing complex. However, at that time, it was only a small section, around seven attached townhouses. If the forest was a sea, this was a tiny island in the middle of it, and despite having multiple neighbors sharing that space, it felt completely isolated from civilization. To say I was uncomfortable would be an understatement, and the truth is I was anxious, and couldn't wait to go back home. Unfortunately, being a minor, without transportation, and unable to leave, I would have to endure it. It wasn't bad during the day, the neighbors had barbecues, and played music, so it didn't feel too isolated. However, as soon as the sun set, around 8.30 p.m., the entire mood changed. The residents locked up for the evening. They turned off their music, closed their doors, and turned off their lights. The silence that followed, was unnerving, and eerie. My cousin made the situation worse, by leaving the front door wide open, to allow the fresh air to circulate. I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Brooklyn, where everything had to be locked up, or risk being stolen, so the idea of leaving your front door unlocked, and completely open, for anyone to just walk right in, seemed absurd and dangerous. But my cousin insisted, with a condescending tone, that it was perfectly okay, because this was a safe area, not like the ghetto we came from, which, until recently, was the same place she grew up. Maybe I was just being paranoid, but none of her neighbors left their doors wide open. After some time, she eventually closed, and locked the door, and everyone went to bed. Being the only male in the house, I got to have one of the bedrooms to myself, but I wasn't going to get much sleep. I couldn't shake the anxiety of the situation. I spent the next few hours, sitting by the bedroom window, looking out into the front of the house, where my sister's car was parked. There were a few street lamps around the perimeter, so it was pretty well lit, but the area beyond the boundary of the housing complex was completely dark. I looked out the open window, enjoying the warm summer air, spotting the occasional skunk, possum, and raccoon scurry along by the dumpsters, looking for an easy meal. It was calm and quiet and almost peaceful, almost, but again, I just couldn't shake that anxious feeling. 
10 p.m. turned into 11 p.m. and then midnight. That's when the feeling in the air changed, literally, the warm breeze stopped, and the night grew still, and extra quiet. Not a sound could be heard, not scurrying animals, chirping crickets, or even the wind blowing through the trees. I felt tense, and vulnerable sitting by the open window, so I lowered the curtains, but continued to look outside. 1 a.m., then 2 a.m., and complete silence, without any sign of life outside those four walls. It seemed all the animals from earlier, decided to hide for the rest of the night. And then the clock chimed, 3 a.m., and as if on cue, there was a sudden and violent breeze, that nearly blew down the curtains. I quickly shut the window, even though the gust of wind had already subsided. I sat back down, looking through the now closed window, from behind the curtains. After a few seconds, I saw something move in the darkness, it was larger than a raccoon but not quite as large as a deer, but it was as tall. It was walking on two legs. It was a man, or at least it looked like one. It was hard to see it from that distance, obscured in the shadows. The figure was dark, like the shadows, but its movement was enough to draw my attention. It moved along the perimeter of the complex, just out of sight, remaining in the darkness. It resembled a zoo animal, pacing the edges of its enclosure. After a few minutes, it stopped about midway, and I assume it was staring at the complex. I watched it, until some movement from the far left, caught my eye, and as a reflex, I turned to look at it. It resembled the first figure. It was a second person, skulking around in the darkness. When I looked back toward the original figure, I had trouble finding it again, without its movement. I scanned even further to the right, and saw a third figure step out from behind a tree. I continued to scan back and forth, until I saw the original figure again, it was in the same place from before, but I noticed it this time, because I could see its silhouette had moved closer to the complex, and it was looking upward, toward the window, toward, me. I panicked, and pulled back away from the window. I told myself there was no way anyone could see me looking out the window, it was too dark in the room, and the bright streetlights would make it impossible for anyone outside, to be able to see inside the room. I wanted to look through the window again, but I was afraid. And then I heard something that shouldn't be possible. It was a gentle tapping on the window, three steady taps, as if someone was knocking, from outside the second floor window. I was frozen, and everything was quiet for a moment. Then another set of tapping, but louder the second time. It was slower, and more deliberate, as if someone knew I was there, and was trying to get my attention. I didn't move, I didn't even breathe. Another silent moment passed before an even louder, more forceful knock on the window. It was three taps with the same rhythm, but much louder. I waited in silence, in the dark, for what felt like a long while, before mustering the courage to look out the window again. I fully expected to see a face staring back at me, but there wasn't any. I searched for the three figures in the shadows, as well as any sign of movement, but I didn't see anything. I watched as a gleam of light began to peek through the tree line. It was just after 5 a.m., and the sun was slowly rising beyond the horizon. It would soon be daylight. I continued watching the tree line for movement, but there wasn't any. Eventually, the sun was high enough that I could see the forest, and the road. Even the darkest shaded areas were fully visible. Exhausted, I dropped onto the bed, and finally closed my eyes. When I opened my eyes again, it was just after 10 a.m. Both my cousin, and sister were already awake, and ready to start the day. I ate some of the breakfast they had left over, and contemplated telling them what I saw that night, but decided against it. This happened during a time before smartphones, so I didn't have any way of documenting it. I figured they wouldn't believe me, and to be honest, I'm not sure if what I saw and what I heard, was anything other than my adolescent, sleep-deprived brain playing tricks on me. We didn't spend another night there, and left that afternoon, hoping to avoid the traffic back into the city. My cousin moved out a few months later without incident, at least as far as I knew. I heard they further developed that area, adding more townhouses, but I've never gone back there. With so much time having passed, I have long since forgotten the name of the area. But, I will never forget, that terrifying feeling, 
when I heard someone knocking on that second floor window. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe for more, and share it with a friend.